welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli, that's Bud Elliott, that's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and everywhere you get your podcasts on demand. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe, smash that like, and come and join us in the chat, a.k.a. the Cover 3 tailgate. Lots to get to here on a Wednesday where, and we'll get to this in a little bit, spring brawl has started. I mean, look. I don't go over the top all throughout spring practice with like going through every practice report, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that I got a little giddy, you know, seeing Will Howard out there just just rolling around for about 10 minutes. See, oh, ooh, is that Cam Ward dropping a 60-yard dime to Jacoby George at Miami's first practice? You know, just we get to hear, you know, Garrett Nussmeyer talk to the the LSU media as well. So, look, it's the very beginning of spring practice. We're going to be excited about everything we've got. So we'll take a look at sort of what we've learned and set the table for some of the big storylines that we are following as spring practice gets underway. But before we get into that, some news of the day where... Those of you who have been with us for a long time, you know, Kyle in the tailgate knows Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning. Buddy, I I thought that we on the Cover 3 podcast can have probably a little bit more of a a nuanced conversation about this because there's some levels to it that can get inflammatory and, uh, you know, seeking attention. But Danny, Mm. I'm sure you all talked about this on the radio show. Oh, yeah. Okay, so... Arch Manning, according to multiple reports, has opted out of being a part of NCAA football 2025, which will launch this summer. Excuse me, EA Sports College Football 25, which will launch this summer. We discussed when the game was coming back whether we would see players opt out. Mm -hmm. Arch Manning does appear, according to multiple reports, to be one of them. What part of this stands out to you as, as sort of the most interesting in terms of how it reflects on Arch or even as the video game uh, as a whole? Oh, by far, my favorite aspect to this is the reports that it's a distraction. That, you know, like, <laughs> Thank you. He is so focused on the playbook and his job as the Texas Longhorn quarterback that he doesn't want any distractions coming out. Um, you know, it's funny because I think one of the first things when this news came out, I texted the Cover 3 group chat and I said, how many guys do you think will sign up? Said 600 bucks sounds kind of cheap. And Bud was like, I think he was the first one to respond and said, nobody, they'll all opt in because they don't want the negative backlash. Like everyone opts in over 10,000 players opt in. Do you, you know, do you get crushed, crushed by the fans that all want to play with you? But I was curious to see if there would be a name like this and really, you know, looking at the name of returning quarterbacks, looking at the name of returning players, there's not a brand that's returning that's bigger than Arch Manning and he hasn't played it down. So I think this is about the money and him saying, you know what? I might be worth a lot more than everybody else. Let me wait and see what happens after a year. Maybe I can get to command the big bucks. I wonder if there's still a chance that he does opt in. If there's a dollar sign that does get up there, that makes it more attractive for him. But I'm actually, I was surprised there weren't a few more names and Arch Manning's the only one that we've really heard about so far. I mean, Obviously, the, the, this analysis could change if somebody does opt out who's not named Arch Manning. But I, I, I kind of look at it as the Manning family has really carefully managed Arch's entire recruitment. Like he didn't do a lot of camps, he didn't, he didn't go to a lot of stuff. They kind of kept him, you know, very private. Didn't do a lot of interviews. They don't want him like getting a bunch of publicity. And I, my thought is like they don't want him if he doesn't hit to get this bust label, right? The overhyped bust label. Like I. I legitimately here arch has done and the manning camp has done very little to drive the hype on arch other than just be a really good prospect it's all chip I, patterson yeah right i i it, it, i i actually think that that they're really just trying to keep it about football like i i what what's the dollar figure that might matter to arch manning i mean would you do it for ten thousand? no like the manning family has hundreds of millions of dollars there's not really a dollar dollar figure, I don't think, that would make it worth it for him to opt in and also make it worth it for EA. So I, I do think this is just, let's keep him out of the spotlight. Let's try to have some semblance of a normal college experience for a guy that's like, you know, the most famous player ever. What? I don't want everybody like posting all these clips of them benching Ewers and, and putting Arch in. I I, I don't know. I, I kind of buy it because the money thing to me doesn't make sense. So I, I my, my mind goes to like what might make sense. 
what's more of a distraction? Opting in like everybody else and you're a part of the, the masses and you're just another guy or you opt out? That to me is then misplayed by them if they thought it was just going to be, oh, I don't want to be, you know, because I, I get what you're saying. I totally agree. They've done a phenomenal job. But that would be my counter. Like, we are talking about this. I don't think we're talking about it if he's one of the 10,000 that just views himself as another player. I think this makes it more of a conversation starter and does, whether we know the details of truly why he opted out or not, I think the backlash is it, it appears on the outside that he views himself as worth more than everybody else, even if that may not be the case. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is there really backlash, though? Like, I, I don't know. Um. For a week, I maybe think, a couple days. Yeah, I mean, it's a news cycle. We're, we're talking about it because it's March 6th, and there's really nothing else to talk about, and we're all just excited about the game. I really don't think it matters. I I think another thing, too, but like you mentioned, part of it, you know, the, the distraction quality of it is, you know, people benching Quinn for Arch in the yeah. game, or what happens the minute, like, you're playing the game, and, oh, look who's popped in the transfer portal. You don't think that's going to be all over social media? It's like, oh, Arch is transferring in NCAA 25. It's like, it's just going to be a nonstop barrage of that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I think it's a little overprotective of the Manning family if it's in, if they're indeed being true and that they're just trying to quiet down the hype. I don't know if this is th the best way to go about it. I don't think at the end of the day it's a big deal. I think it's just a video game and everybody's going to be in it either way and everybody realizes it's a video game. But I don't think it's for money because I don't really think Arch Manning comes from a situation where he's in desperate need of getting money. And that doesn't mean, you know, people who have money aren't trying to get more. We're always trying to get more. It's just I don't think that's the ultimate motivating factor here. I think Arch Manning is going to get what he wants if he wanted the money. I mean, isn't it true? Like, he's not really doing NIL deals either. Like, does he have any I've NIL deals? I've heard conflicting issues on I've heard conflicting reports on the, that. The only one that's official is with Panini for the, the trading card. Like, mm -hmm. a very, like, traditional trading card NIL deal is the one that they have. His camp has boasted as, like, we're not taking big NIL deals. We've got a trading card deal. We like that. Um, if Quinn Ewers goes pro, I think he's in the game. I think that this is a managing that quarterback room yeah. situation. And it is just about the like, okay, we, we're going to be looking at this all off. Even though Quinn Ewers is the established starter, even though we're going to talk about Quinn Ewers as one of the top quarterbacks in the game going into fall camp. Okay. Well, how does Arch look? Oh, oh the game came out. Well, what's Quinn's rating and what's Arch's rating? And continually creating another avenue for fans and people outside of that program who are not in that locker room to try and create controversy where it might not be there. So I think that Quinn's decision to come back had to play at least some factor because if Arch is the undisputed QB1 for the Texas Longhorns, sure, why not opt into the game? Like it's, it to me seemed almost like a, like a team move, you know, as much as anything else where, is it going to be a distraction for Arch specifically? Maybe not. I mean, you know, as somebody who was close to Arch Manning once, not that I know him personally, that I was literally like 10 feet from him for about 20 minutes one time on one day. But, I mean, he does seem to really enjoy the, like, he, his parents and his family have instilled in him the simple joys of playing football. Like, Danny, you and anybody else who's played football at a high level talks about, the camaraderie with your teammates and like all of the things like you just want to be out there with your guys playing football. I don't think that Arch Manning is a salesman enough at this point in his career for that to be fake. That does seem to be what he wants to do. And if there was any belief that this was going to create any kind of division in the quarterback room or any problems for the chemistry of the team or the offense, $600 ain't worth it. You know, you can come back. Guess what? He'll be in the game next year. And then you can be QB1 and maybe even on the daggum cover. Question for you. Yes. If he beats out yours or if yours gets hurt, does he then opt in? <laughs> I don't know. Like, because it, it sort of feels like they're selling it as a, like he hasn't really earned it. Like there's no reason to be in the game as a backup type thing, which I, I get. I'm not saying it's the right move, but like, I do think that's sort of the, the methodology behind it because I, like six hundred dollars. Like there's no there's no amount that EA could pay. That I think it would make it worth for Arch to be in the game because it's not like people won't buy the game if Arch is not in the game. Like he, he's not an integral part. Of, he's the most famous player in college football by far, but he's not 
the most integral part of college football. Like it's not a make or break thing if Arch Manning's in the game. So if he actually earns that starting role, does he opt in midseason? See, that's when I, I mentioned at the end of Monday's show that I had a take that I was going to save. And I didn't even mention to you guys after the show because we got talking about work stuff. But my brain might be poisoned right now because I have spent so much time kind of watching quarterbacks as far as projecting them to the NFL. And it's not really functioning as just evaluating them as college QBs. But watching like Quinn Ewers last year, are we that sure that Arch Manning won't be the starting quarterback at Texas before the season ends? Because I just, I don't know, Quinn, Quinn's running the offense, but like the zip on the ball just does not seem to be there right now. And I don't know if that's like a, a result of the broken collarbone last year or what, but it's just, it's a lot of, a lot of lofted passes to the outside and just deep shots. It's just, I, I don't know. It's like, I don't think Quinn Ewers is the as solid of a starter as we're all just assuming. We're going to talk about a team coming up in spring, but I'll, I'll tease this. Who is more likely to keep a starting job? Jalen Milrow or Quinn Ewers? Quinn Ewers. Quinn so. right now, I think, yeah. 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 I mean, they both they bo- both lost, all, they went to a playoff game and, and you know, lost the semifinal game. Like, that's... I get what you're saying, Tom. There's been flashes. I think the consistency has probably been the biggest issue with Quinn Ewers with me. Like, he's been really solid at times, and he's been up and down. Um, Like, in the Oklahoma game, he brought him back. Like, he started off so bad with a couple interceptions, but then he started kind of slinging around, was more impressive. But, yeah, the top tier thing we don't truly know is what Arch Manning's got in that top tier. Like, he's been projected, and he's supposed to be that upper-tier arm talent, but we haven't seen on the field yet. I'll tell you this. Quinn Ewers got to stay healthy. Hadn't done it in two years starting. You know, other quarterbacks have gotten opportunities. So you would expect Arch Manning will play somewhat this year if the trend continues. Uh, you know, he he's going to get the first off. It throws. It drives me insane. Yeah. Uh, one final thing on that. Matt Brown, who does the Extra Points newsletter, does a very good job with it. Uh, he offered this insight, and he has been sort of close to this EA Sports college football game process for a long time now. He said, I would be wary, I'm paraphrasing here, Matt, I apologize. Um, He said, I would be wary of any reports like this about players who are opting out this far in advance of the actual deadline and that there still could be, to your point, an opt-in later that totally reverses it and makes all of the hand-wringing moot. Um, But it's definitely something to know that while Colorado's Travis Hunter, Georgia's Carson Beck, Alabama's Jalen Milrow, Oregon's Dylan Gabriel, and Texas's Quinn Ewers, according to EA Sports, have all opted in at this time, according to Orange Bloods, ESPN, and others, Arch Manning has opted out. I Those guys all need to continue to build their brand for marketing purposes. Like Arch Manning is way more famous than Travis Hunter is or than, than Carson Beck is, right? And I don't think... I don't think any of them came from families that have like hundreds of millions of dollars and also have their own production company. <laughs> yeah, it, it exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think back to recruiting camps of like, okay, who were, who were they with at the camp and what did they drive? And I don't think any, like, like the, there were no Bentleys <laughs> being driven by, by Carson Beck's dad or by Travis Hunter's. Um, shoot, I think it was his grandma who was with him. What, like, what so, a great differentiator from the, what is, isn't Carson Beck driving a nice car now though? I, I remember yeah, reading a story. Like, th- that's the thing is those guys, if, if their agents would tell them, Hey, it's not about the money. Now it's about like becoming somebody's favorite player who you grew up playing with in this game. And they'll buy your Jersey five years down the line. It makes you more marketable. Arch Manning doesn't need that. He's already a lot more famous than those guys. Yep. Good point. Coming up on the other side, Neil Brown has a new contract at West Virginia. We don't talk about every contract extension, but this one's got a couple of details that are very interesting as it pertains to the future, uh, both at West Virginia and elsewhere. Uh, We've got some questions about the Dartmouth men's basketball team. More on that if you haven't followed that story. And like we said at the beginning, spring practice is underway. Here's some storylines that we want you to be keeping tabs on. All that and more next CBS celebrates Women's History Month. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, news came out on Tuesday that Neil 
Brown, head coach at West Virginia, has agreed to a new deal with the school. It only adds one year onto his contract, which will now extend until 2027. But, and this is thanks to, uh, shout out to Hoppy Kirchable, Metro News. He was able to offer a little bit more insight into this deal, which includes some things that were a little bit head-scratching. Number one, a decrease in pay from what he was scheduled to get over the next three years. Number two, a reduced buyout. And all of this comes after he went from the hot seat to nine wins. You know, he's he, what Neil Brown has had West Virginia bowling in three of his four years as the Mountaineers head coach. His record now after a nine and four season is just over 500 as the Mountaineers head coach. We went into last year identifying the fact that West Virginia had back-to-back -back losing seasons, something that they had not done since the late 70s, and said, man, this team, which was picked 14th dead last in the Big 12, they're not going to win any games. He'll be fired by mid-October. I was wrong about that big time. But now he agrees to this contract extension. He goes from hot seat to contract extension, but in doing so takes a little bit of a pay cut. Danny, is this a Neil Brown specific thing, or do you think that we will see more of this kind of back and forth going on uh, as we move into college, the future of college athletics? Um, It's a unique situation, although... You know, the way, it, the way it appears, like the reduction in salary, I don't think you're going to see that. I think that's Neil Brown specific. I don't know how many coaches are going to sign up for that just to put in some language on the buyout. And he also, you know, I need to add this. Fired, he gets he wants, to, he wants to reinvest in his assistant pool. That's another part of the reporting is that, you know, we're going to, we're going to be paid $400,000 less. And I would like for that to go be reinvested into the program for assistance and support staff. Which yeah. is great. Also, if you go from 100% guaranteed buyout for a deal that had that number of years remaining, and then you, you change it to a 75%, but you do lengthen the, the contract, the actual number that West Virginia is guaranteed to pay you, I think is relatively close. Like it, It's not like he's taking an actual haircut on the buyout in totality. Now, he is taking it compared to what we would normally expect, but his resume at, at West Virginia is, is just not sparkling. But also, we don't really know... Like what what should West Virginia be in the Big 12? What should West Virginia be in the new Big 12? We don't really know. We, we are seeing this with all these teams that escaped the Big East. And what we find out that the Big East was kind of a crappy league, honestly. Like, especially once Virginia Tech and Miami left, like, that league was bad. R you know, Rutgers was competing for it. Pitt was competing for it. Like, a lot of teams that just, you know, like, they're, they're very rarely competing for, for Power 5 conference titles were very competitive in the old Big East. And... West Virginia has had what five winning Big Twelve records in twelve years since joining the league. Like he just had one this year. He had the second best season they've had since joining this new conference. So I think he's like a reasonably competent coach. Who are West Virginia fans excited about this? Do they think like they're going to take a step up under Neil Brown? It, like who else would you go get? I know they had money problems, like big time money problems, was last year or two years ago. N not on the scale of Arizona, but there was some stuff going on there. Seems fine unless you, I don't know. Like, do you think they're going to improve a lot this year? What what what's their expectation from uh, from Vegas? Eleven and one. <laughs> okay, I mean, yeah, you know, like I do wonder if there's an expectation that now with Oklahoma and Texas gone, they're supposed to step in and compete for Big Twelve championships. Six and a half wins. <laughs> so that's, so that's a, is is what FanDuel has them for. Um, juice basically even. I mean, if, if Vegas is right and he goes seven, five, six, and six, this contract doesn't look that dumb because you didn't give the guy a big race. Right. Then why'd he take it then? Because who, nobody else wants him. Right. So you get an and extra like, year. Like Neil Brown would not get – like there's nothing Neil Brown could do based off this currency or this past season to elevate to another job. Like he's not a hot name. Mm. I do just wonder like w when do the fans get tired of it? You know? So I – I actually two years was, ago, <laughs> like, <laughs> you ask our former producer, <laughs> got to restart that hype cycle. You know, <laughs> fans believe in something. So I, you have mentioned that, but sorry, I didn't mean to not address you, but I was wondering if this is the beginning of the decreasing of coaching salaries. I was wondering if we start to see, like if, if we are really going to say that five, six, seven years down the line, 
the coaching salaries are going to come down, especially for the Neil Brown types. You are at a program of a certain level, but you are not at one of the programs. And the idea, like that's the, the first place that I'm going is not the first or second best job in a conference where we're going to see the decrease. It's in the fourth or fifth best job in a conference. That that's when they're like, all right, the going rate at this school is no longer you sign up and you just automatically get $5 million. Now, Neil is going to be making just a little bit over four, but you could make that same argument that, you know, if on very, very small levels, we start to see more deals created where it, it might just be funny accounting, but you're at least like saying, okay, we can't drum up the extra half a million dollars for assistant coaches anymore. Neil, if you want that, then it's going to have to come out of this right here. And that's where I, I might be over my skis, but I was just wondering if this is the beginning of what you have called as being like the projection that we are going to see things start to come down and the market level out just a little bit. I mean, I, I do think that uh, we are going to see a real leveling off of coaching salary inflation. I'm not entirely prepared to say that we're going to see a huge haircut for it anytime soon. But I do wonder if schools are going to start thinking, like, should we give this guy a 10-year fully guaranteed deal when very quickly we're probably going to end up play, you know, paying players closer to what they're worth, which means paying them some of that TV revenue. If you're if you're a West Virginia fan, would you rather pay Neil Brown $4 million, or would you rather pay like any, just pick him out of a hat, average coach like Neil Brown, you know, $2 million and kept Ty Key Smith, who went to Georgia, and kept the key Mesador, right, who went to Miami and a, and a couple other guys who they've lost, who I feel like they were just not as competitive for NIL-wise. Like, I'd rather have the players. I don't think Neil Brown's some special coach that you know makes the average players that West Virginia is able to keep much better than they are. Like, they won a bunch of coin flips last year. Right? And I, I like Neil Brown. I think he's a fairly decent coach. But the players are what matters. I don't think you're going to keep seeing some of these coaches make this the amount of money they do. I do think it would be wild, Chip, to your theory that Neil Brown would be the coach that started it. Well, no, Jim Harbaugh started it. Jim Harbaugh took a huge pay cut heading yep. into the 2021 season. Yeah, but that wasn't NIL related, though. That was in well, coach. It, that was. I, and I don't necessarily think that uh, Neil Brown is. I don't think Neil Brown is NIL related. Like I, I really think it might just be that in the money, in the overall, you know, money bucket, Neil Brown's like, I'd like more money for my assistants, and West Virginia says, we we don't have it. Well, you know where we can find it in your pocket. So let's do some funny accounting. Let's, you know, move this column to this column. And then we don't actually have to go and fundraise anymore because maybe an NIL would play a role. We're already asking our boosters to fill up the NIL war chest, but just, you know, the, everything's going to shrink. It's going to shrink for athletic directors, assistant athletic directors. It's going to shrink for head coaches. It's going to shrink for everybody at the top of these salary lists, where if things are going to get siphoned off, to head towards the players and people and programs are preparing for that. And you're going to have to make it, make it work somewhere on the spreadsheet. I do think if I was like a director of high school relations or a director of on-campus recruiting, I, I think I would really, really be thinking long and hard about a career change in, in, in the long term. Like, I don't think you can retire from those jobs. So those jobs are not going to exist in the current form 10 years from now. I, I don't believe, um, Shoot, I had a, I had a, I thought a really good point. No, I don't. <laughs> that happens to me all the damn time. Don't worry yeah. about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm locked and loaded with really oh. good points always. Oh yeah. So, nice. Oh yeah. So I I read the Chris Lowe article today on Alabama, and it I, it's it's what you would expect as far as painting things in a certain light. But according to Chris Lowe, uh, they went after DeBoer and Norvell uh, first. They kind of downplayed the landing Sarkeesian thing as like they knew it was not gettable. Okay. Um, if you think about DeBoer and Norvell, by far the biggest questions about those guys that remain is their ability to recruit at an elite level. Out of high school. Yes. Yeah. Like that, they, they got everything else licked. You know, evaluation, player development's been really good, play calling, in-game coaching, very few questions in those areas. That The only real random questions are, like, can Mike Norvell recruit at a high level? You know, can Kalen DeBoer recruit at a high level? Now, this could be that Alabama AD Greg Byrne has a blind spot for this, okay, because he has hired some guys before at spots who are not good recruiters but are really good game coaches. It just might be what he does. Or 
Greg Byrne might be just freaking genius if in two years we go to some kind of model that doesn't involve recruiting nearly as much. And then you got one of the very best X and O player development uh, coaches in the sport and Kalen DeBoer locked in. Like if there's any kind of change in this sport where recruiting matters less, then that makes that DeBoer hire that much better. Mm -hmm. You thought about that? I, I don't know. And there's certain coaches out there whose value would go way down, obviously. Right. Because you're because you're not considered a great coach. You're only there because you're a great recruiter and accumulator right. of talent. Yeah. Um, Tom, what's your? Uh, uh, I got to get you out of the tailgate, Tom. Like I'm, I cannot ban you, but like I can hear your typing. Like I, I'm, I'm sorry. Hearing you, I'm hearing you just. Just, <laughs> just I'm just trying to teach some of our. I'm trying to teach some of our viewers what the word nepotism means. They think <laughs> us talking about Arch Manning or Arch Manning having a backup position at Texas is nepotism. I, they, they, people, they're turning the word nepotism the same way they did the word literally, or they're just completely changing the definition of it. I, I let's uh, hands off the keyboard. Let me, let, let me hear your voice. So what's your question about the Dartmouth men's basketball union ah. unionizing? Yeah, this is, this could be a very stupid question, but it is something that I just wondered to myself. Now the, the Dartmouth men's basketball team has voted to unionize, which is being seen as you know the impetus to all athletes at college levels becoming employees at some point which i get it it's a big deal but aren't dartmouth basketball players on academic scholarships like no do, they I, are not. Is, ivy not? League, yeah ivy league does not have scholarships he said academic though academic scholarships some of them could be so they're not on they're not on athletic scholarships is my correct point. Right. So then couldn't anybody at Dartmouth who is on a scholarship of any kind then also sue to be an employee? Like, I don't get how this works at the Ivy League level. Like, if this was a ACC school doing it, I feel like it would be the impetus. I just don't understand. Nobody has explained that to me. How are they employees? If they are employees, isn't every student on campus an employee? No, because being a student doesn't generate revenue. And even the, even though the Ivy League media rights deal is probably not worth much, I would say that you still at least have the connection that as a men's basketball player for an Ivy League school, we are generating revenue via the Ivy League's payout to the school. If I'm on a, just an academic scholarship to be a biology major, then it's not as though I am generating revenue for the school. But does this not set a precedent for any student across the country who is on an academic scholarship that they are generating revenue for the school simply by being there? According, well, according to the uh, regional director, Laura Sachs, she decided the players are employees, even though they didn't receive athletic scholarships or generate, generate large profits because of the strict control that coaches and athletic department officials have over players' time and conduct. Uh, so I think that's the difference. Like they're allowed to say you have to be at practice from two to five where a student on an academic scholarship has more freedom to say, you know, you, you don't have to do anything for the but school does in return. A, that's, that's fair. But does a student on an academic scholarship not also have to meet stringent requirements of maintaining their grades and showing up at class or risk losing their scholarship? I would say it's that not. That makes a them an employee of the school. I would say it's not as strict. I would say an academic scholarship, yeah. they're probably circling back at the end of, sem of the semester. They're not keeping tabs on you on a daily and right. weekly basis. Punching into the clock. Cool. Like if you miss right. practice, you could get you know kicked off the team. You could have you know all the stuff that comes with that. The, there's also um, in 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 her her statement, uh, they they talk about how you get preferential admissions as well, which, which is sort of a trade off. Like there is. Well, yeah, a, that's the only reason Barton could ever get. Yeah, into that yeah, yeah, right. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, so I, I I don't know that Dartmouth is uh, is the best example of somebody who I would consider an employee. Right, yes, which is. is the whole thing that blows yeah. my mind. This is the school and the program that's going to blow this whole thing up. And they're but it the is interesting the that they find employee status, uh, and there's political stuff to this, obviously. Mm -hmm. But that they find employee status at a school of this level. And Dartmouth basketball, by the way, is terrible. They're like, I, I was going to say, my my very I serious... I Googled it this morning. It's like, yeah, oh my they God, won last night. Yeah. yeah. 
my very serious yet unserious take is that I'm I'm not gonna say that they're uh, they're employees because they're not working hard enough. Dartmouth basketball stinks. I feel like they're taking some union breaks like during the games. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> taking union breaks on defense. I mean, this this is what happens. People unionize and everybody just gets lazy. Just you know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> Can I ask you guys something? Because you know, my big fear all along, and maybe I've fallen hook, line, and sinker because it is the NCAA company line is if you start paying the players it'll you know bankrupt the game you know it'll it'll the athletic programs will go under they'll start shutting down programs and while i understand that the biggest pay the players proponents have all said oh they're lying about there but don't worry there's plenty of money to go around i think that's 100% the case football will be fine basketball will be fine women's and men's probably maybe baseball at a lot of programs but this type of school and this program specifically is the example of who would get shut down if they have to pay these employees. And so that, mm-hmm. so you don't, so uh, am I falling for that, or do you think I, they could survive? I think in some ways, because the, the the thing that doesn't get discussed is that schools use sports to attract people to their schools, both the athletes, because it like admissions are falling across the country, mm-hmm. it, it, especially at, at some of these private schools, having a team is a way to guarantee you get 11 more people enrolled in your school. It's also a thing you can pitch to other students. Hey, come to Dartmouth. Yeah, we have a great education, but we also have some semblance of like the the TV style college experience. We have basketball here. Like go to the basketball games with your friends. Like nobody wants to go to just a pure, not nobody. Most kids don't want to go to just a pure commuter school type situation where it's just a school. There's no sports at all. There's no extracurriculars. There's, there's no nothing. Like there's no you know, collegial feel to the campus. So I actually think they would not cut many of these sports at all because it's an overall money maker. It's a loss leader in the overall money making business for these schools. Yeah, like I, I, I would. Bet I'm still that from Matt Brown, by the way. Like, like, like he, he's talked about this a bunch. Like, they're not actually going to go out of business, guys. Like D two exists. You know, D three exists. I would bet that if you looked at like Alabama's out of state tuition numbers and like students in 2008 compared to where it is now because of Nick Saban and what that football team did, it's drastically different. Uh, 100%. Like, totally. I, I was an out of state kid who went to Alabama because I just got a really lucky day on my LSAT and they bought my LSAT score because they wanted to increase their testing, their, their testing numbers. Like those like oh, 07, 08, 09 law school and admissions class at Bama were like very juiced up by out of state kids. And their rankings rose up a lot, like top 20 U.S. News and World Report type thing. They like The Saban thing was so much bigger than that. Like, Look how many kids from like Jersey and New York mm-hmm. and Chicago and Dallas are out of Alabama now because – not because they really care that the football team is that good, but because of all the publicity that having a good team gets you. And like, the wow, look at that game day experience. Like, Look, look at how much fun it is. Look, look, look at the Greek life thing there. Like, There's all that kind of stuff they see on TikTok and – I mean, it's it does matter for your school quite a bit. What yeah, about I, what about your buddy that we played golf with, the uh, coach at UCF? Was it tennis, right? Yeah. Well, aren't you worried for him, kind of, that that could be seen as a club sport? Like, if you have to pay them employees, that's a pretty significant cost. And I could see schools saying, "Hey, we still love it. We love the competition, but we're going to make it a club sport. It's opt- you can opt into it, you know. And it's just because we're not going to foot the bill anymore for your scholarships, though." If we actually had to to go down that route a little bit, um, however, there's an interview I was watching the other day with, with the guy who kind of wrote Title IX, and he doesn't think that all athletes are going to have to be employees. He he thinks that's sort of a scare tactic, and like women's sports don't make money at, on the whole. A, a, a couple you know unique cases do. Most men's sports don't. It's it's football, good amount of basketball very few baseball. I do think there's a real possibility to split some of this off. You know, like before 1984, we didn't really have this problem because nobody was making all kinds of crazy money. And then Georgia and Oklahoma sued for their TV rights. And then, you know, coaching salaries skyrocketed like a hundred thousand percent. So I I think there's a real chance to split this off where we have kind of a paid division and a non-paid division. And to your point about D2 still exists, D3 still exists, like there would still be an attraction of me as a 17-year-old Olympic sport athlete going somewhere, even if it's not paid, because I would get to be able to play college sports at a somewhat high level. 
people also really want their kids to play college sports. Yes. Like well, they because pick, they, they get a free schools. education. They God, they pick schools that are terrible fits for their kids just because that school's letting them play sports. Like, what? But don't you think uh, that's for the full ride because you get it free? No, I'm saying like, like they pay to have their kid play sports because yeah. they want because they don't want to feel bad about all the money they waste on travel ball for 15 years. <laughs> so like, like, Danny, Danny's kids are good, so like, like they won't be him. But like, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But no, and like that's the other thing too. Like, not all these sports get full rides. Like most of the sports, once you get past football and basketball, they're only partial rides. You like baseball scholarships, maybe in the SEC there's a lot of full rides, but I know in the Big Ten, it's not full rides for the most part. I do think the most interesting thing was the budgets proposed. Cause like what if you did have a school that wanted to keep basketball or or excuse me, I shouldn't say basketball because I think that one will survive, but uh women's soccer or women's lacrosse or whatever it is. That says, you know what, we can't afford it, but you guys can sign up to be amateurs. If you want to play in return for a scholarship, and that's what we're paying you, you know, and you're not an employee, but that's what you get in return, then great. And that's what we'll do. I do wonder if there's a delineation where we start having professional athletes that are paid and have traditional student athletes like we, you know, we're supposed to have for the last 75 years. Yeah, Dave uh, in the tailgate mentions that men's his, his kid is men's track half scholarship. Oh yeah, baseball, it's all Indeed. you know, partials. I mean, it's all over the place. Um, um, Trip in the chat has repeatedly used this example. I, I think it's a good one. The, the university hospital model, right? When it actually starts making money, they kind of break it off and they affiliate it. Like University of Tennessee Hospital is not actually run by the University of Tennessee. They just sort of license the name, and there's a connection, but it, it's the. the there's an important lack of nexus of control so that it's not actually run by the school. The same thing you would have to have here for the athletes. Interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah. And so then we can talk about the enrollment cliff of 2026 and why they're still going to do everything they can do to be able to create more people coming to college because there's not as many 18 year old Americans in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you got, got to keep the money going, baby. Let's go. I got oh, one. Like, like, do I need to have a 529 for the boys? Because like that, they might be begging begging our kids to go to college. Well, that's what I was going to say. One small suggestion if they want enrollment up, make it a little bit more affordable because it is. Ah! Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's... <laughs> have y'all noticed the cereal bags are getting smaller even though the boxes are still the same size? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, enough of trying to solve the world's problems. Let's talk about ball. So coming up on the other side, spring practice. It gets underway this week. It's already started at Alabama, Ohio State, LSU, and Miami. Florida, Notre Dame starting soon. What are we keeping our eyes on? We'll let you know next. Blackout history. Welcome to March Madness. Oh, no. oh, you just never know in the tournament who is going to shine. Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. Back here on the Cover Three podcast, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I would, I, I really did get some sort of feeling. You know, we spend all this time just sort of like crunching numbers, talking about the transfer portal, and, and there's, you know, it was kind of like that free agency aspect of it. So when we did get to see some, uh, when we did get to see some of those new quarterbacks out there, when we did get to see uh, some of those players talking to the media, the rhythms, we got to see. Kalen DeBoer, I mean, shout out to Michael Casagrande. I mean, just a good dude through and through. But did you see his super cut of Kalen DeBoer walking into his first po his first press conference after a spring practice? He had three camera angles. He went through like slow-mo. He wanted to capture history in the making. Kalen DeBoer stepping uh, to the mic for the first time since the retirement of Nick Saban. Um, Danny, I'll let you get first crack at this. Again, Alabama, Ohio State, LSU, Miami started on Tuesday. Florida and Notre Dame start on Thursday. Take it anywhere you want. Um, what what are some of the storylines, or what are you keeping tabs on? Uh, the newcomers, new faces, new places. You mentioned DeBoer off the top. Uh, Chip Kelly, some very interesting uh, comments he had about being happy and how he's free. like he just felt like a new man, and he's out there. I see him joking in practice, you know, yucking it up with Caleb Downs, a couple new guys there. I also thought Devin Brown's comments were pretty interesting. Him calling out saying, "Hey." Everybody thought I was going to transfer. I'm not going anywhere. You know, Will Howard, again, how is he going to fit in that system? Um, yeah, just like all the new, the newness and trying to keep track of it is almost impossible. You know, like we know about the top tier, but, you know, we talked to Jeff Levy today on the morning show and like it was, it's like, all right. Um, oh yeah, Blake Shapin's there. Oh my God, I totally forgot that Blake Shapin was his quarterback. And you're like, 
it'll take a while to get used to some of these names. And just when you think you might have a handle on it, you'll have the post spring transfer portal period. Maybe I'll have to learn them again, but yeah, I think Ohio state, like that, the, the Ohio state and Bama clearly are the two biggest um, spots uh, for kind of the different reasons. Curious to see how the quarterback battle plays out because uh, Austin Mack, the kid coming in from Washington by all accounts is just an absolute beast. And when he comes in there, it's like, Oh my gosh, this guy looks legit. And then you see Jalen Miller with his shirt off. and like, he's been working. He's been putting some time in the plate, you know, in the work in the weight room. We're so much so that I'm like, dang, dude, slow down a little bit. Tom Brady was saying elasticity. He wasn't saying bulk up, you know. Yeah. I can't all right, let me interject real quick with it. Did y'all see the Chip Chip Kelly quote about quitting coaching? All right. Mm -hmm. So Chip Kelly told reporters, uh, I don't know if I've got a good Chip Kelly right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I never thought about quitting that. I don't care. Quote, I never thought about quitting or not coaching. I'm going to coach and then I'm going to die. Chip Kelly. <laughs> That's a great one. Great he was one. referencing the Beatles, right? As far as, uh, you know, how it's happy he was. I mean, he's 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 in a good place. Great place. Because he real. I think he real. I mean, he's going to crush it this year. <laughs> you know, like he's going to crush it. He's going to be able to contend for a national championship as opposed to being as he on the hot seat the whole year. And the next year he pops right back to the top of the list. Bud, you mentioned the uh the Alabama quarterback battle. What's what's your sense of uh that Austin Mack, Jalen Milrow, sort of all the pieces going on there in Tuscaloosa? I, I think it'll be Milrow, but I don't know that it'll be Milrow. I, I'm hundred percent confident that Milrow is gonna start at at least at some position for Alabama because the way he looks in the weight room is ridiculous. Like that if that guy like somehow loses the quarterback battle, he's probably just gonna be their starting tight end or like edge rusher, which <laughs> is another position I'm watching for Alabama because they they lose both Braswell and Turner to the draft. Uh, like, is Keon Keeley for real? Is Keanu Coke going to step up there? I think the entire secondary is a major question. Uh, they added Damani Jackson, formerly of USC, there, but that I mean, their secondary got rocked. Uh, offensive line is another one to watch there, and also receiver. Are, are we going to start 17 year old Ryan Williams? Uh, is Jeremy Bernard? who is like receiver four for Washington, is he going to be featured prominently in this offense? I kind of wonder uh, how aggressively Alabama is going to be portal shopping here in the spring window. Because when I when I pull my depth chart out and I, I start to assemble it, uh, this this is a team that certainly has a lot of uh, raw talent. But man, it is uh, there's not a lot of experience raw talent on this thing right now that you feel, you feel good about. So I don't know, it doesn't, Saban said in that article today that, that he felt really, really good about this team. Uh, and then he guys were asking about, like, hey, what's my path to playing time and, and what's my NIL? Which like, huh, Nick Saban's not getting the Nick Saban discount anymore. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's it's going to be interesting to watch this Alabama spring practice. There's a lot of, lot of moving pieces here. Tom, what you got your eyes on? Honestly? Do you want the honest answer of what I have my eyes on for spring practice, or do you want? Excuse to me. Let me, so let me draft. let me rephrase the question. Um, what are you interested in among these teams that are getting going this week? Like, what are what are you going to? I'm interested in not grinding. Getting, a, what, what what are you interested in uh, finding out information about? I'm interested in everybody getting through healthy. That is the only thing I am ever interested in when it comes Coach. to spring practice. Coach speak. I, yeah, I just I don't want to see a team get you know like I don't want to see a key player get hurt in spring practice and then like miss the start of the year or maybe miss the entire year. So for me, especially when we've still got another transfer portal window coming, when I approach the spring, don't get hurt. Let's see, like you know we talk about quarterback battles. Nobody ever names their starter in the spring anymore unless that guy was already the established starter. So there's not that really storyline to look to for me. Stay healthy and see what movement there is afterwards in the portal because then you kind of do know who's going to be the starter when somebody's hitting the portal. You kind of get a much better idea and kind of like what Bud's saying. Alabama, the roster that's showing up at spring right now, is probably going to be entirely different than the Alabama roster we see on the field in September. So for me, spring practice, cool. All right, don't get hurt. Quinn Ewers was named starter at, directly after the conclusion of spring practice. I, I don't think it is totally foreign, even in today's transfer portal era. Uh, there are other, I would say that there are other spots where you're looking to just sort of get a sense for how somebody is fitting in with their team. I mean, uh, Miami standout defensive end, Ruben Bain, talking to reporters yesterday. 
what do he say? He's got a little strut. He's talking about Cam Ward. So he's got a little strut to him, got a little swag to him. He's stepping in. He, he is providing that kind of electric presence that you would hope you would get. Something that Miami saw for one year when they got Derek King in there and they were able to, you know, really start to take some steps forward. You know, can Cam Ward be able to go in there and take control of that locker room and be a leader for that team when he's really just been, you know, two years at Incarnate Word, two years at Washington State? Can you impress that upon your teammates? So that's, you know, we've got Riley Leonard who's going to be doing the same thing coming up here at Notre Dame. What do we think ends up happening in terms of his connection with that wide receiver room? Where even on Monday show, I think we were just kind of throwing our hands up. I don't know who the good pass catchers are going to be out of there. There are lots of good options, but not necessarily like a, a one go to. So I think that you can, in the limited amount of availability that we get with college football paranoia, I think you can start to get a sense for you know how the pieces are coming together for a certain team in spring practice. I'm yeah, also but going curious. back to your Texas example ahead, with Quinn Ewers, that's a very different situation because you had the hype machine of the guy we were talking about at the beginning of the show. So Steve Sarkeesian just wanted to quiet all that Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning down and just say it's Quinn Ewers because it was always going to be Quinn Ewers. So sure. Does he do it again? Think... Does he do it again after this spring? Does he have no, to? No, I think I think it's – he might – I don't know if he'll – he'll probably get asked the question, so I don't know, but I, I think it's kind of established that Quinn Ewers is the starter. I mean, he, he led them to the Big 12 title in a college football playoff. Like, are, are you going to be trying to bench him this spring? No. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I don't know why you wouldn't. Um, cause it, you, Arch is not a real transfer threat. So, I'm interested I'm not- in this kind of LSU-Notre Dame swap, right? So, LSU is losing a mobile quarterback. They're returning an awesome offensive line. Notre Dame is gaining a mobile quarterback, but they're losing two really good offensive tackles and the, the run games at both spots are going to change quite a bit style-wise. Like Nussmeyer can't do some of the same run game stuff that Jaden Daniels did. How will Mike Denbrock use the new quarterback from Duke, Riley Leonard, who's an elite athlete, probably a better runner than he's a passer. He's not a bad passer, but he's a, a really special runner and especially a scrambler. How will he use him with Notre Dame's offensive line, which I would expect to take a step back, but maybe not a huge one. I, I will, we'll see how it looks. So like stylistically, they're almost trading you know, what they're doing run game wise uh, with the change in quarterback and the change in offensive line and, and coordinator here as well. Lots of stuff again. I would go ahead. I was going to say, it's pretty funny to me that chip mentions Notre Dame's receivers and Michael shows up in the chat out of nowhere. Just, <laughs> it's like the bat signal. <laughs> hey, and look, hey, I, they I, were I, all I, injured. According to Michael, all look, of them. <laughs> There is, anytime I'm looking at um, a collection and I just don't know what to grab, a, there are only but so many. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys knew this. I know that you guys have been around football your whole lives. But when you throw a pass, did you know only one person can catch it? Get a lot of people of don't talk about that. Huh. So, you know, it's, it is important to establish, you know, a few options. You can't have all your, your whole room on the field at the same time, no matter what A11 or whatever those new wild offenses tell you. So, yeah, I'm, it's something you know, to keep track of here in uh, spring I, practice. I have read the rule book, Chip, and I don't see any rule in there about how you can't cut the ball in two and throw it to two different receivers. <laughs> we also have simultaneous <laughs> possession. Yeah. See? You know? um, a lot of rule, a lot of loopholes yet to be exploited by innovative coaches. That's all I'm saying. You know what else? Go ahead, Dan. Go ahead. I think we'll see this maybe more in the spring games when they start taking place. But the new rules, I'm curious to see what it looks like, what teams start to do with the communication, the quarterbacks, what impact that has. You know, I don't know if they'll be able to – we won't notice it. I think the being able to see the iPads in between series is huge for the regular season. I don't know if they'll practice that as much. But I'm curious to see who, who does it, who doesn't. Because you're still going to see – as much as we're saying goodbye to the Teletubbies on the sideline, there's still going to be some schools that use them because they go no mm-hmm. huddle. You know, they have to be able to signal – you know, plays and, and routes and, uh, you know, all kind of things. So, but I'm curious to see what that can do with teams that want to go pace, um, you know, go even faster, kind of just int- intricacies of that. I think is going to be interesting. They're, they're going to use them on defense too. Uh, yeah. To, to signal it, like, like you're, you'll probably get your coverage call into your designated player, but for the teams that have to defend tempo team, you're likely going to call your front call with, with the board still. Right. Uh, mo- most likely. Um, they're also have a shortage of these right now. I, I, I watched DeBoer's press conference and he was talking about how, you know, they're excited to learn how they can use them 
uh, but they wish they had more of them, like, like the, the helmet, the comms, because there's a shortage right now. He's like, so we got as many as we could get, but obviously with, with the shortage, it, it makes it tough. So I haven't really seen that reported on much, but apparently so. Um, I mean, if Alabama's having trouble getting some, I imagine some <laughs> other schools probably are as well. Right. Yeah. Who's the first one to try to hack in the signal, the radio waves or whatever they're using, try to listen in? He also talked about how big schools. Yeah, I can yeah. think of a couple. Yeah, schools Purdue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he talked about like how it actually was difficult to use uh, potentially in the stadium with all the noise. Like, uh, at, yeah, I'm assuming that's, that was the first thing. It's hard to hear. It comes in convoluted and you see it all the time. NFL guys going like this, like I'm trying to hear you're cupping it over your ears. But college stadiums are louder, especially in the SEC. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, in there. I would hope that since I played, the communication has come a long way. I told you guys we'd get some interference every time, you know, a little bit. We'd have like a Mexican polka station. You could hear it like off in the background. I would hope that 20 years later we have fine-tuned the frequencies that they're using. But there's always the threat. I mean, the NFL has a rule in place where if one team's communication goes down, they both have to go down. Like you can't use them. So – there clearly are issues still that crop up from time to time. And so what, what impact could that have potentially? And see if anybody just turns it down altogether. I'll be curious. I don't think anybody will be that crazy. I think you have to take advantage of it, but some teams might just ignore it and have it ready to go, you know, for a two minute or something. A couple more things here uh, for the spring. I saw on Bucknuts that Ohio state looks to be using more tempo this year. So checks out with Chip Kelly, put that in the notes. Um, which also checks out because I'm not really sure their offensive line is that great, so you can use some tempo to help yourself there at times. Uh, Miami, I, I, I thought David Lake and, and, and Gabby over at our Miami 24-7 sports site did a great job. There's like a lot of guys missing spring, or at least who weren't out there at the start. Nigel Kelly, Mesador, uh, Fletcher, the, the stud running back who got hurt in the bowl game. Apparently that's not an Achilles, but it's he's still not back. So I'm kind of – that's a big piece for them. Because uh, Trevante Citizen, a kid I know they liked, he got pretty badly hurt like last year or two years ago. And he's not close to like, uh, they don't know if he's ever going to be at that level again. And uh, who else was out? Oh, uh, the Maui Noah brothers. Are, 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 yeah, I was listening to their podcast yesterday morning. So I don't know. Like anytime you see guys miss spring, you have to just jot it down if you do our jobs. Like, okay, is he going to be back for fall? Like, is it something to monitor? How long is he out? Is he going to miss part of summer? We we just don't know. And if I am a coach, to Tom's point, I I get them as ready as possible, and we use all this spring to be able to continue to develop the depth. You know what? I don't need to know whether the Maui Goa brothers are capable of playing on Saturdays. Yeah. <laughs> Check. <laughs> We're good there. Don't don't need to learn anything about that. And let's you know we can spend those spring practices getting them healthy, and then being able to uh, to get then being able to get their backups you know even more ready. Uh, comment from Jay Peter Woods working out at DN. That's right. The defensive tackle for Clemson is down 15 pounds, and his goal is to shed about another five or so and get down to like I think he said 290, 285, 290, 295. He was well above 300 um, coming in and maybe start moving over to that defensive end position. Woods is a gifted, gifted football player. Yes. Be uh, be interesting to see uh, how that goes. Clemson was one of the first ones to get going. They got going last week, I believe, on Thursday or Friday. So they're up and rolling as well. Uh, they finish but with a pizza party? They, uh, I don't know if they can ever go back. I think I Dabo promised that pizza party like Jackie Moon promised corn dogs if someone hit a half court shot. <laughs> I mean, like all of a sudden they made the college football playoff at 15 and 0. And everybody said, Pizza party, Dabo, for everybody. He said, Oh no. <laughs> Thank goodness whoever it was that provided the pizza came through in the clutch. Uh, but you've got a couple other notes in here. Um, Houston, Donovan Smith. Yeah, so Donovan Smith looks like he's going to need some kind of shoulder work done. That sucks for him. I kind of think Zeon Chris was going to, because uh, they took him as a transfer from Louisiana. Kind of thought Zeon was going to uh, win the job anyway, but maybe it would have been, or maybe still w- will be a battle. We, we don't know. I, I don't know what kind of shoulder procedure uh, he's going to have, but he's got some kind of shoulder thing. And then uh, something I'm looking for is how do these UF offensive tackles look? 
Uh, I, I was at the the coaching clinic with Billy Napier, and he routinely uh, mentioned uh, that like they had guys who he he classified basically as guards uh, playing tackle last year, and the offense is going to look a whole lot different now that they have real tackles uh, in his estimation. So. Uh, I guess UF feels good about these transfer tackles that they took, and I'm curious to see if everybody else uh, also feels that way about them. They had guards playing tackle. Who'd they have playing guard? See? <laughs> I, I I mean, look, they had Damian George playing tackle. Bama played him at tackle for the most part. He wasn't good. Uh, and they had Austin Barber, who I think is a good player. So could yeah. just be narrative. Uh, certainly could, but something I'm watching for with, with these openings. And, and look, I'm I'm not trying to, you know, just just make this like a yeah, duh, but a lot is changing. We talk about a lot. That Houston update, don't forget, that's Willie Fritz's team now. Yep. Mm-hmm. This is a really, really big spring practice for the Cougs as they prepare to do the same challenge as Neil Brown at West Virginia, the same challenge as Sonny Dykes at TCU, Chris Kleiman at Kansas State. You've got an entirely new look to your conference. Who's going to run out there and go establish themselves? So big, big spring and big season ahead for uh, Willie Fritz at Houston and the rest of those big 12 coaches. Thursdays, we get interactive. What does that mean? That means if you come and you hang out with us live at youtube.com slash cover three, come jump in the tailgate, drop a question, we might answer it. And if you go and leave us a five-star review, and in that review, you put a question, we'll tackle it. A future mailbag episode from the big old bag of mail. So it is your questions, our answers coming up on Thursday. Come hang out 11 a.m. Eastern time. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Bud Elliott 3. You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry about the keyboard noises. <laughs>